Derek, welcome back to the jungle. Three, two, one. This is the jungle, an up close, unvarnished look inside leadership and business strategy. We wade into the real world leader's face and explore what they do to create a path forward because that's what business is. Wild, exciting, it's the jungle. Derek, welcome back. How are you doing? Uh, just terrible, terrible, Doug. It's, it's, it's not good. It's been a, a rough week and the podcast is still here, but it's just, it's been uh, something else in, in our time in history. How are you doing? It is, uh, it's just uh, terrible. There, there's, it's, it's hard to find the words and uh, the emotions of uh, anger and sadness and disgust and frustration and confusion and uncertainty and fear uh it is and you know i can't imagine to understand what it's like to be an african-american during during this time but uh it's just been difficult it's been difficult um i think everyone is waking up to a new reality they're waking up to things that need to change things that have been here that still need to be changed and trying to figure out what what to do how to move forward uh difficult time in our country uh difficult time in our country but hopefully on the positive that there are good there's good that comes from this that there's change that comes from this that there are new opportunities and and things that we do to correct these issues that that i i'm trying to find the hope in this situation that we can we can come out better as a country as people as individuals um but it's difficult yeah very difficult um hard to grasp and understand i won't begin to think that i can understand what uh, some of these communities are going through because i don't um there are pervasive issues of racism and inequality um we need to change some of these uh you know but i i don't have any answers uh don't pretend to do i'm going to try and open my heart and mind educate myself as much as i can and and try to figure out you know what, what kind of what our role is um and that's it. And, and that's that why, more effectively. And that's why we, we started this podcast. In some ways, it goes back to one of the original intentions was we started this podcast all about, uh, you know, the jungle and, and being leading in strategy during a time of crisis. And at that time, it was COVID. COVID is still with us. And we have a new crisis right now. And we started this with a spirit of of humility and trying to learn and listen and be curious to better inform ourselves, better inform our listeners of how to, how to move through. And I think people are, are still kind of approaching that with a real open mind, open heart to uh, navigating this. So um, it's a, yeah. it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time in business. It's a difficult time in the world. Uh, difficult time in society, d- just difficulties. Um, and now, uh, you know, uh, we started the podcast and, and we've got crises layered on top of each other now. Uh, the pandemic's still here. Uh, businesses are hopefully starting to open up, and we're hoping to see a light there. Um, but I mean, now we've got this uh, the recent um, uh, racism and equality issues that we need to face uh, head on. Uh, so it's it's great to lead to 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 learn though. I know there's an opportunity for us to all get better. Uh, let's let's keep learning from some of these leaders, and and um, you know we got a great great guest who who's. Uh, been in her role for a very long time. She's uh, very informative. So, so tell us who we got here, Doug. Tell us yeah, who so we're we talking about this week. Yeah, so we had a great conversation uh, with Birgit Close, who is the president and CEO of The Right Place. And The Right Place is the regional economic development organization uh, for Grand Rapids. You know, looking at her bio, uh, really impressive. I mean, she's not only a, a leading authority on international business and economic development, she's been on a number of really important boards. Uh, her organization has created over 47,000 new and retained jobs, $4.7 billion of new investment under her leadership. Uh, not only all has she been really accomplished, but she's a really accomplished Bronco. So she won the Outstanding Alumni Achievement Award, uh, in 2012, uh, she actually got her degree in finance. So from the uh, great uh, Hayworth College of Business, so uh, one of our own. So it was a real treat to speak with her. 
and and she's in a really important role thinking about leading the business community in Grand Rapids during these crises. Um, so it was a pleasure to talk to her. Uh, what was your what was your takeaway from the conversation? Yeah, so uh, following our listeners again, we're going with give us one takeaway and what you can do now. Um, her her focus on on the importance of the strategic plan. It's it's not something that you create, you sit on a shelf, and it just sits there, right? A big believer in, in having the strategic plan, actually making them more frequently because things are changing faster. She talked about daily, midterm, long term, uh, and, and it, it, strategic plan has metrics that you're always looking at because, you know, in her view, what measure gets uh, implemented and, and gets moved on. Uh, so I think that's a critical thing. Uh, I, you know, there's some differing philosophies about this and the strategy making process, but. Uh, going through it and constantly revisiting it and understanding um, that process and, and sticking to it helps you stay in your lane. And in situations like this, that plan could actually help you understand what your role is in all of this. And she, she kind of mentioned that on the podcast, which was really good. So, you know, take away for firms, don't, don't treat a strategic plan. And I've seen some bad ones in, in my days. Like it's just a, a one year event. It's not critically important to you. It's not one of your main focuses and it's not a guiding post for you. So, and work on it frequently and make sure that it, when it needs updating, you update it. And when it needs to be changed, you changed it. The, the world's always changing. Um, but don't just uh, make sure it, it forces you to stay in, in your lane and, and figure out what your role is and, and how you're going to contribute because that's, that's the importance of that plan. Uh, so take it seriously uh, and do it right and, and do it frequently. What do you have, Doug? What was your takeaway? Because she had some good ones and you know, there's emotional challenges for, for uh, her in a role right now. Yeah. So that, that I love that the takeaway around revisiting the strategic plan and figuring out how, how you contribute. And I think you and I have, have been having a lot of those conversations of how do we use the podcast? How do we think about our classes? How do we engage our students? How do we engage our community in ways that we can be uh, to, to, to play our, our, our role, do our part. So uh, lots of listening though these days. You know, great conversation with uh, former Mayor Bobby Hopewell on Friday, and we're, you know, I think a lot of conversations and listening is what needs to be done. Uh, the takeaway that I had uh, that I uh, want to focus on is really around emotions, and uh, you know, there's so many emotions flying through the air right now. And she talked about the importance of uh, reaching out personally and validating people's experiences and emotions that they're feeling in an authentic way. And I think that is really critical during this time because everyone's experiences going through this is different and there's lots of emotions and they're very intense. And I think being able as a leader to reach out, to connect emotionally and provide that space, that container for people to process is really critical. And it's, it's, there's, so, there's an education process, a, a more of an understanding process, but there's just an emotional process that's happening right now. And so I think that was a really important um, takeaway for people to consider. So uh, really important guest, really appreciated her, her time, a great Bronco. We hope everybody enjoys this conversation with Burkett Close. The Jungle is produced by the Center for Principled Leadership and Business Strategy in Western Michigan University's Hayworth College of Business. Our center supports the leadership and business strategy major, conducts large-scale consulting projects, and trains professionals in acquiring and operating small businesses. To learn more, visit wmich.edu forward slash leadership center. Birgit, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to The Jungle. Oh, thank you very much. Do you have a beverage on hand? I have my uh, mint tea. Mint tea. Yes. Cheers. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Derek, what do you have today? Uh, green tea again, Doug. More tea drinkers than ever on this podcast. That, we have a lot of tea drinkers. I'm drinking uh, some iced tea today. Um, so, Birgit, thanks so much for taking time to join us today and, and, and share your time. Uh, you know, we started this podcast uh, back at the beginning of the COVID crisis you know, really focused on leadership and strategy during crisis and recognizing that, you know, events were so new and we, there was no playbook and we really wanted to learn and listen from leaders of how they're approaching these situations and not looking for right answers, but looking for the, the process that they're going through in, uh, in this really challenging world. 
and uh, you know we record this podcast uh, during some very difficult times uh, in our in our country that I know all of us are are heartbroken about, um, and are are really putting these challenges in front of a lot of business leaders, in front of our society, uh, in front of education as it comes to issues around racism and, and inequality, uh, and you and you have the pandemic going on as well. Um, so we just wanted to kind of step back first and, and start to hear from you kind of a, a behind the scenes of how you're thinking about leading um, the right place during this really challenging time. Well, I think, first of all, thank you for having me and thanks for asking those questions. So my team and I have been working remotely, although I have to admit um, I'm working in the office. So I'm one of the two essentials in the office now for going on pretty much three months. We, we actually went out a week before um, the, the, the order came of, of closing, um, simply because we took the temperature and I took the temperature of my team members, and it was becoming very clear that people were becoming uncomfortable um, and, and feeling um, maybe it wasn't the right thing to do to have, I have a team of 35, continue to meet in the office. And so I very early uh, with my leadership group decided let's give people the opportunity to work from home. So the majority of, of the team has now been working from home for over three weeks. And, and I think what, what became very clear to me very quickly is everyone, res, everyone res, responds to a crisis like this differently. We all have emo, different emotions. And, and during these difficult times, you have to respect all of those. They're all authentic emotions. I like to work from my office. But I know that a very large number of my team appreciates being able to work from home, and, and we have been extraordinarily um, productive. I also know that some of my team members are anxious to get back. All of those feelings, emotions, um, uh, fear, anxiety are, have to be respected by the leader of the organization. We all cope differently. Um, I also have a young team. With, um, with children, um, so they are not only working, they're also becoming teachers at home. Um, so it's a whole different set of circumstances that none of us are prepared for. But as a good leader, I believe you have to take into consideration the human, they're all human beings. They have families, they have children, they have, they have uh, maybe aging parents who are not living here, whom they can't see. Those are the things that you have to really take in consideration whilst managing your way and still doing the work that needs to be done through a crisis like this. So very early on, um, I think it was the first day when we were working remotely and the phone started ringing off the hook with respect to where do I find swaps? Where do I find, or this is a business community and the healthcare community now reaching out to us because the right place obviously is the business organization that is connected deeply into the entire manufacturing supply chain in West Michigan. And I will tell you, thank goodness, thank goodness, we're still making things in this part of the world. The, the phone literally ran off the hook from healthcare organizations, the sheriff's department, the sheriff's department in Nuevo. Where can we find all those things? And the team, you know, we have a st very good strategic plan and we can talk about that in a minute, but the team pivoted because we knew we needed to identify who has these things, where can we find them, and if we don't make them ourselves, are there people who can make them? And within a very short period of time, manufacturers in West Michigan stood up and said, hey, Birgit, can I help? I think I can make this. Um, we have a, what we call the MI device group, the, um, it's a medical device group, a very large group of companies making medical supplies and, and medical products. They helped, our IT community helped. So we stood up an entire supply chain around personal protection equipment. And that's how, how we added value and leadership in the community and in the region to really identify and manufacture these things ourselves. And today uh, we have over 80 of those companies on our website. So through it all though, um, you know, I'm, I'm a person too. And I learned about myself that I prefer to go to the office. Um, that I like some structure, but I don't particularly care for working from home, um, although I do occasionally. Um, and that I miss, I miss the hubbub of my office. 
Yeah. I miss the personal connection with my team. So the, 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 the questions around, um, you know, this, this point around the emotions and there's so many when the, from the pandemic starting to, to recent events, the emotions are, are strong and they are unique to each individual and they are all over the place and it's emotionally challenging for lots of people. Well, how do you as a leader approach creating a space or engaging around those emotions to, to, you know, hear them, to give them space, to recognize them? I, I think what, what I did is regularly communicate, sometimes individually and sometimes with the whole group. Um, very early on, um, we, we started, um, and this may s sound a little frivolous today, but it really isn't. We started happy hour um, with F for anybody who wanted to join, um, just to give people a sense of relief. And, and, and I mean, just a release to, to not talk about work but to talk about gardening or the little one who you know had a funny day or whatever so that people had still a, a connection and i know that some of the team members are getting together on their own as well just to boost each other up but i also realized it had to be repeated more than once that your emotions are valid your emotions and your anxieties or whatever you're feeling they are all valid. What I feel is valid, what you feel is valid, and you are in a safe space to feel that way. Um, so there are no wrong feelings. Your feelings are your feelings. And, um, and if we don't recognize that, I can't expect my team to be productive because there is fear, there is anxiety. Some of them are appreciating working from home, some of them don't. And so, there has to be a clear and concise and repeated message of be authentic. It's okay. It's okay the way you feel. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about um, as you've gone through this, uh, you've made decisions early on to let everybody work from home besides yourself and a few others. Uh, yeah, one other person. Okay, one other person. C can you maybe get down to our listeners that these challenging times are really hard to manage through right now and lead through. Can you uh, maybe talk tactically how you're making those decisions? Like what steps you're going through to decide which actions are good and bad with a remote team now? And as you move forward, how do you, how do you organize and just manage that remote team to decide what actions are appropriate and what are not in, in, in these current but circumstances? I have a, um, so the, the, the team of Right Place is, um, 35 uh, team members and my my immediate reports and I make it make the leadership team and there are five of us right we stay in constant contact um, somebody may have an idea I, I am not a know-it-all um, uh, and if if I can uh, the, the team of five um, we get together regularly and say okay what's going on today what are you hearing because each one of them has direct reports that I may not see on a regular basis. And, and they all reach out to their teams so that there's constant contact, feedback, communication. I think, like always, it's, it's all about communication, isn't it? Um, and so, so that we know somebody is you know, feeling like that today, somebody is else feeling like that. But then the, the other thing we did, so I stay in close contact with, with my uh, direct reports, um, we communicate almost daily. We have regular um, scheduled meetings, of course. And so you really look at it on a daily basis, on a midterm basis, and on a long-term basis, right? So with all of the executive orders coming down, how do they impact us, right? And then digest those and, and let the rest of the team know this is how they affect us, this is how they don't. Um, we very early on uh, created a small subgroup inside the organization, look at, okay, when we reopen, when we are allowed to reopen, what does that look like? <clears throat> that wasn't Birgit's decision. That has to be, there has to be buy-in from the whole team, all of them, that say, um, yep, I'm, I'm going to feel comfortable coming to the office with a mask and all of the other things that we do. And if you don't mind, I would prefer to work at home. And so I made it very clear um, that the, the management team decided 
it's going to be a I cannot afford I cannot accommodate more than 10 of my team members in this space. You know, we all have open office now, right? And and so, you know, when you know you have hoteling, whatever it is, it just doesn't work. And so um, 10 is the maximum to, to accommodate, at least for now, um, until this passes. So it's totally voluntary. I and mean, we made it very clear, nobody will be forced to come in here un unless you're comfortable. <clears throat> It could be because you enjoy working from home. It could be because you have young, young ones at home who now stop school next week, right? And so you have three months. You already had three months of the kids at home. Now you have three months of vacation at home. How do you take care of the children? You may have a spouse who is a frontline worker who cannot take, do this. Um, so, and, but, but the buy-in had to come from everybody. You know, we, we meet as a whole team on a regular basis. There is a, a smaller group that meets on a regular basis and then there's my management team. And so it comes from the bottom up and then we look at it and say, does this make sense? So that there is consensus. When you, I want to loop back on some of the, you said communication is so important and then I'd love to switch gears a little bit. The, when you, what is your preferred, I, you're highly responsive to email uh, on the emails that we've exchanged and it's, it's, it's very rapid. Are you, are you an email person, a text person? How, how are you facilitating your All communication? All of the above. Um, All of the above. I, um, what's been interesting to me, um, uh, I am now an email person, a text person, a team person, a Zoom person. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I never, you know, we, the way we're communicating right now has obviously become um, highly accelerated. Uh, you know, a few of us might have used it on occasion. Um, um, uh, my husband has been on Skype for the business he works for because it's long distance for, for, for years. And I occasionally do it with my sister and niece in Germany. But all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're all having a Zoom meeting or a team meeting or whatever. Um, and so I've, I have um, become an accelerated learner of this technology, let's put it this way. Okay. Um, you know, if it's a long email, it's an email, but we text, you know, call me or a, a lot of my team members are now, um, are you available on Teams? So then we, we just chat like this. So the technology has really helped, I think, because at least you can see people, it makes it easier. To me personally, speaking only for Birgit, um, I miss the, the, the personal interaction of having somebody, you know, knock on the door of my office and say, hey, do you have two minutes? Um, but while we're in this, this is about as good as, we, as it gets, right? So um, you released a, a statement um, earlier, I believe today, around um, yeah, yesterday, yeah. yesterday, addressing the, the the current situation and and this intention to you know, tackle the pervasive issues of racism and, and inequality, you know, impacting communities of color. Um, as you start to as this the events have unfolded, um, how are as you uh, leading an organization starting to make sense of and approach um, uh, th these issues? Well, may, let me backtrack a little bit. So um, I've been an economic developer now for a long, long time and the CEO of this organization for 32 plus years. And uh, obviously we're very proud of our track record um, and feel that we are in a very fine community, however come about, right? We, we recognize the inequities that exist in our continue to exist in our community some time ago. Um, uh, several years ago, um, under the leadership of a previous board chair, Brian Walker, we created actually a committee of the board to look at how do we, how do, we do economic development more inclusively? This is a very difficult question. I, I will tell you, this is not a marathon. I mean, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Um, and we started reaching out to other organizations now. Our Chamber of Commerce has been doing a fabulous job for many years on, on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion classes and, and training. And that's something that, you know, that's not our lane. It's, it's, I'm not, we need to, it needs to be a holistic picture. And I can also tell you that the economic development community in the country, uh, of which I'm a member, um, we have these conversations constantly at our 
at our uh, conferences, etc. How do we tackle this? How do we go about it? What is our lane in this? There is workforce development, there's economic development, and there's community development. They intersect. But, but what do we as an economic development organization do? Um, so we started working with um, the, the um, Minority Supplier Association, um, uh, Council, I should say. We started work, looking at what, what kind of companies do we have in West Michigan that are minority owned? And we found out some interesting statistics. Um, only about 10% of the minority owned businesses, this is pre-COVID, um, in West Michigan, in, in my region of West Michigan, are actually wealth creating companies. What do I mean by that? Um, most of the uh, most of the small businesses owned by communities of color are service industries. They may be a beauty shop, they may be a grocery store, they may be, but and and I'm not saying that's wrong, but we only have about a dozen companies that are owned by minority owners who make things who make products for the auto industry, who make products for um, the furniture industry. And that's where we want to make a difference. Um, be because that, that is wealth creation for the long term. And it feeds, those jobs feed um, the service sector jobs, right? If you think about manufacturing, regardless of who it is owned by, one manufacturing job creates four service sector jobs. Every one manufacturing job creates, every dollar created in manufacturing creates a dollar 89 in the service sector. So the lane that the right place has always been in for 35 years is in that sector that we call the wealth creating sector. And I don't mean by wealth creating, it's, it's, a, it's a tough term sometimes. I mean that if you make something or you have a service that's get exported out of your community, that brings in new money, and that creates wealth in the community that then allows um, for another small retailer or whatever it may be. So that's where we are, where we are looking, not looking, but it's baked into our strategic plan now to, to invest resources into the creation of those kinds of jobs and businesses. So you've mentioned your strategic plan a few times for the right place. And then in a previous answer, you mentioned you know, we are making decisions now and because we're in, we've got overlapping crises on top of each other, daily, midterm, and long-term. Uh, has any of the recent events made you go back and reflect your strategic plan? And, and do you want to talk about the strategic plan a little bit and, 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 and how you came up with that and, and how that's driving your decisions today? Well, uh, pre, I mean, like I said, I've been the CEO for 30, 32 plus years. But the organization has always operated with a strategic plan. Um, personally, I'm a great believer in them. And, and, and I don't talk about a plan that has a fancy cover and sits on my shelf and I can wave it around and say, oh, isn't this great? We, we did this, right? Um, our strategic plans are very, very, they are our they are lifeblood. They are, they are work by documents, if you will. And um, we used to do them every five years. And we now do them every three years because five years is a very long time horizon anymore in the in a world that's with technology just has speeded up, right? And and for better or for worse, this pandemic has speeded it up even more. So in nine, 2019, um, we went through a very, very a robust strategic planning process with my board, my team, and over a hundred community members because Remember, we're a community organization that delivers economic development. And so we don't just do this in our own little bubble. We want other people's input. And we came up with a very strong plan um, looking at the strength of the community. What do we need to work on for the next three years? And I'm also a great believer in metrics because if you don't measure it, you don't do it. And so, and we rolled out that plan four months ago on Fe February the 8th, right? Um, it feels like four years ago, um, but the plan itself, the mission, the vision, and the strategic priorities have not changed. I believe that if you don't have a plan and you come upon a, uh, um, a situation that we find ourselves in now, overlapping tragedies, um, you will get lost if you don't have some kind of a guidepost to keep you on, on your path, because it's very easy to get dragged into 
than other issues that are not yours, that are not your lane. So when, when the pandemic started and we started doing work around the supply chain of PPE, that was in our lane. We knew our manufacturing companies. And, and while we didn't work on, that to us became part of our business retention strategy, which is the biggest part of our plan is retain, retain, retain first. Um, and while we couldn't visit with companies in person, we certainly could visit with them like now or on the phone. And so um, the plan um, is still our long-term plan. Did we make um, tweaks in the, in the, we didn't tweak the strategies. We did tweak our um, tactics uh, because if you can't go visit a company in person, how are you gonna make a retention call and then help a company expand? So, but interestingly enough, while we were standing up this entire new supply chain of PPE, we were still dealing with companies that wanted to expand. Um, you know, and everybody's like, really? Yes, there, there's always an opportunity in every situation. And so we are still working on projects at the same time. And then we have a group in our team called Hello West Michigan, which is a talent group. And they reached, started reaching out to HR organizations. So the plan still works, but, but if you don't have one, tweaking, uh, you can't just make it up as you go along, um, in, in my opinion. The plan helped us a great deal in focusing, being able to pivot. And we now notice that we're pivoting back, you know, while, while the immediate, and I'm not saying we're out of the woods with COVID, uh, while th that crisis is beginning to wane and companies are starting to open up, we're, we're starting our, our workforce development work, we are starting our retention work, and we actually have some companies that are not from here who are looking at move, uh, coming to, to West Michigan. So, but the plan really, really is our guidepost. And then you can always tweak on the tactics, but you, you need to have a long-term vision that you need to stick to. Um, and and um, and deliver on. Let's do one more question here, Derek, and then we'll go uh, <clears throat> rapid fire. So you know the the images that we've we've seen in the last week are just they're just really difficult, and uh, the emotions. Uh, I mean, myself through the the anger, the rage, the sadness, the fear, the frustration, the everything about what you see around race and inequality, and um, just the everything and um i'm curious you know and then you start to feel like i'm trying to figure out how as as i as a leader do i engage and listen and support um how are you approaching kind of your role as a leader as you think about issues around diversity inclusion and, and kind of use you kind of use that term of it's a marathon how are you kind of taking those first steps well again uh, part of it is in in our plan and and um and really reaching out to friends in that community. Um, um, pre, pre the tragedies of the last few days, um, mayor, our mayor in Grand Rapids had created a task force um, on how do we you know, revitalize small business. Um, we at Right Place received a million dollar grant from the MEDC. A lot of our colleagues around the state did and they were specifically for Main Street businesses, and we're very pleased that um, we had a million dollars for 11 counties. We had over, we had thousands of applications, and we could only make 195 um, uh, grants. And in Kent County, 35% of those grants went to minority-owned and women-owned businesses, and and. We are very proud that we could do by a third of those grants. So, and and it was, it was it was by good judgment that it happened. Um, and so we are reaching out, working with the mayor, working with our um, business community, and how do we really move forward? I, I think one place where the right place can play a role is in supplier diversity. If we are in fact the organization that that does that works with all of our manufacturing community, um, how can we get better at um, purchasing from minority-owned businesses? How do we do that? 
um, how do we support those small companies that are owned by the communities of color? What, where is our role? How can we roll that out? How can we get our large corporations to, to, to start, um, whether it's corporations or large organizations like our hospitals? So that's where I see our role is in growing, in growing the business community. Um, and I think you, you know that we are in the process of creating a, a, a venture capital fund um, for businesses, for entrepreneurs of color. And we're making progress, um, obviously because of the pandemic. Some of that got a little shoved back, but um, we are well on our way to creating all of the legal structure and, and um, raising funds. Um, so that's where we, where we can play a, a role in, the, in part of the business community. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's and great. I, 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 if I may add, yeah. um, uh, th this is so jarring. Um, what what is happening that um, there's it's hard to put into words the emotions that are going um, through me through my team um, uh, it, it, we are all Americans and let's all treat each other that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well and, and, and particularly in Grand Rapids, the, the demonstrations on Saturday were peaceful until a group of non-peaceful folks with nothing to do with, the, with it, with the demonstrations, showed up to create havoc and vandalize our town. And to me, they hijacked the cause of the demonstrators um, for their own nefarious purposes. And by doing so, gave the demonstrators the rap who had nothing to do with it. And I would like to say um, it, it, it's the right of every American to peacefully demonstrate. That's First Amendment rights. It's not your right to swoop in, weaponize that right, and create havoc. No, well, well said. Well said. Um, so we'd like to close out all of these as our, our tradition. Try to bring a little bit, maybe, of cheer, positive. Uh, we could spirit. use some cheer, right? Yeah. To try to, if we can play a role to bring in a little positivity, we'll we'll try to do it. Um, so we have some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Oh boy! Sure. Okay. Sounds uh, dangerous. Your your favorite leader? Angela Merkel. Uh, courage or compassion. Uh, courage. Speed or accuracy? Accuracy. Great ideas or great execution? Great ideas. A word to describe your leadership style? Never let him see you sweat. A night owl or an early bird? Early bird. If you are, were facing a dangerous jungle and uh, had to complete a task in that jungle, a, a difficult business decision, and you're walking into this unknown context, who do you bring with you? My husband. And is there a, is there a product that you would bring with you? Mosquito oil. <laughs> and, and if you had um, an animal uh, that really embodied the spirit of your leadership, what would be your spirit animal, Birgit? An elephant. An mm -hmm. elephant. Excellent. Um, a, a female elephant. A female oh, elephant. You gotta tell us. It's a matriarchy. Now. Remember this. Oh, it, it is. That's true. I watched. It's the matriarchy. Yes. Excellent. It's always a female elephant who leads the herd. There you go. There you go. Great answer. Well, uh, Birgit Close, really appreciate you joining us. Great Bronco, leading a phenomenal Thank organization yeah. uh, in Broncos. Grand Rapids. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Take care.